Hi everyone, welcome back. Welcome to part three of our gentle introduction to conformal prediction and distribution-free uncertainty quantification. I'm Steven. And I'm Anastasios. And in this part of the tutorial, we're gonna tell you about risk control beyond conformal prediction. So we're gonna tell you about how you can do things like confidence sets and other notions of statistical error for a large number of learning tasks. So coverage is not always enough because often you'll have a a machine learning problem where you need to look at something more rich like intersection over union distance or the false discovery rate or the false positive rate and we're going to tell you how you can control those notions of error so you can deploy your models with confidence. So there's a few examples of learning problems where coverage is not going to be enough. Um, consider a segmentation problem. So I have images here and these images contain in this case some part of the image contains a tumor. Okay, so I want my algorithm in this case to segment, to find the pixels that correspond to a tumor, and to outline them. In this case, I might judge that my algorithm is doing a good job if I have some control over the false negative rate. So I might want prediction sets in this case that are guaranteed to contain 90% of the tumor. As a second example of a learning problem where you might have multiple statistical error rates, consider um, jointly doing OOD detection with confidence sets, with coverage. So for example, I might have this image here of a squirrel, and this squirrel has this cool hat and this feather on it, so it's out of distribution from ImageNet. You don't see that in ImageNet. So what, I'm, what I want my algorithm to do in this case is to take this image, assess whether it's OOD or not. In this case, it should say yes. It should say this is OOD. Um, if not, if I had an image that was not OOD, I might want to say, no, it's not OOD, and say it's either a squirrel or a chipmunk, but I'm not sure which one. And I might want to tell you something about, I'm 90% confident about that set. So in this task, again, there's two things going on. There's OOD detection, and there's confidence sets, and you need to control both of these error rates at the same time, and we'll tell you how to do that. As a third example, you can consider object detection, which is I hand you an image, and for each image you want to um, identify distinct objects in that image. You want to segment them, which means identify the pixels corresponding to that image, and you want to classify each, um, each object in that image. So we'll show you a video of that. In this video right now, you can see for every single frame, we are outlining the distinct objects, we're shading them. Um, the algorithm had to pick out all the distinct objects, and we're returning a classification um, prediction set for each of those objects. So we're in the video, we're returning sets in such a way that I can promise you I'm picking up 90% of the objects. Um, I have high intersection over union distance with those segmentation masks that I'm returning, and I'm getting at least 90% um, coverage with the classification prediction sets. So we'll show you how we did that in the next 30 minutes. Um, again, the kind of key um, launch point from conformal prediction that we're going to think about today is the notions of statistical error. So we're going to call them um, risks or the average of losses throughout our talk today. In the segmentation example, the notion of error that I wanted to control so that I could deploy my model was the false negative rate. So using the technique we're going to show you today, we're going to have a guarantee like the following. The probability that the false negative rate exceeds some threshold alpha that I specify in advance is bounded below some tolerance level of delta. So in advance, I tell you alpha and delta, and then I run the algorithm, and we know that unless we got unlucky, we have an algorithm that is now controlling the false negative rate. For OOD detection and coverage, I now again have two error rates. So I want the probability that my false positive rate is too high, or that my missed coverage rate is too high is below delta. So unless I get unlucky, you know, with probability less than delta, I'm going to have an algorithm that is, has the right false positive rate and the right missed coverage rate. Lastly, for the segmentation example, the most complex example, we had three error rates. So the first task was identifying distinct objects. So we're going to control the recall, the um, fraction of true objects that I failed to detect. We're also going to control the intersection over union distance of the segmentation mass. So this means that I can promise that the uh, mass are very close to the kind of ground truth pixels corresponding to that object. And lastly, we're also going to control the coverage. So those prediction sets for each object are going to contain the right, um, the true class with probability of at least 90%. So 
So we can control all three of these error rates at the same time. And going even beyond these three learning tasks, whenever you can define a, a notion of statistical error for that problem, you can control these risks using the techniques that we're gonna show you. Beautiful. So now that Stephen has given you the lay of the land, let's start with an intuitive example of the procedure. So we're gonna pick one of the simplest uh, versions of this procedure to start with, which is the, the tumor segmentation one, okay? So just to make things a little bit more concrete here, we have, we have X's and Y's as we always do. The X's are images. These are like images of the gut tumor in this case. And then here are Y's, the Y's are binary masks. And what I've visualized below is the output of a machine learning model um, that takes in this image and then it tries to give you an estimate of the probability that each pixel in that image comes from a tumor, okay? So what I've shown here is like a cross section. You know, I've taken like a cross section of the image that looks like this. And, and I've just plotted it here, okay? And then the output of the machine learning model is for each pixel. It gives you a number between zero and one. That's that model's estimation of the probability that that pixel comes from a tumor, okay? And that's the white line that I plotted here. Actually, this should be a p-hat, p-hat tumor. It's the estimate of the model, but it's not true. The model doesn't know the actual probability that comes from a tumor. It's just an estimate, and we need to calibrate that estimate. We're gonna calibrate it in the way that guarantees you contain most of the tumor. That's what we mean by, we, by saying we control the FNR, okay? So how are we gonna do this? Well, we're gonna do kind of the obvious thing, but we're gonna do it in a rigorous way, all right? So we take the, the model outputs, which is this estimated probability of tumor, and we're gonna threshold it at some level lambda, okay? So let's think about what happens when we change lambda. When lambda equals 0.7, we look at all of the places, all of the pixels in the image, where the estimated probability that that tumor, that that pixel comes from a tumor, is greater than 0.7, okay? So that's, in this case, it's these two little peaks, and those become our prediction set, okay? In this case, our prediction set is just a set of pixels in the image, okay? So these are all our prediction sets. And by the way, um, just in terms of the color coding here, white means true positive, so it's tumor pixels that we got, that we segmented correctly. Blue is false positive, so it's things that we call tumor but are not actually tumor. And then red is false negative. So those are tumor pixels that we missed. Now, what we're really controlling is the red. The idea is like, if you're a doctor, you really care that if there's some part of the tumor somewhere, you know, you wanna make sure you don't miss it so that it doesn't grow. Um, but you might wanna be a little bit conservative in the way that you, I don't know, extract the tissue. I'm not a doctor, but and I imagine it's a reasonable thing to wanna to contain most of the tumor in your segmentation. Me so, too, me too. Good. <laughs> We're working on it together. Maybe we'll talk to the doctor and try to get a second opinion here. Um, but yeah, so in any case, getting back to the main story, um, we threshold these probabilities at level 0.7, and then we get this little prediction set here, okay? Now, what happens if we threshold at level 0.3? If we threshold at level 0.3, well, there's a lot more pixels that have a probability at least 0.3 of being tumor. That's this entire envelope here. And so our prediction set ends up being bigger. So, you know, in the ridiculous case, if we take lambda equals one, we contain nothing. Our prediction set includes, it's just the null set. Um, everything's black or red. Um, and then in the other ridiculous case where lambda equals zero, we include the entire image in our prediction set. So we don't miss any tumor pixels, but of course we're too big. Um, and the goal is to kind of pick the sweet spot in the middle where um, you're giving the smallest prediction set that's guaranteed to contain, let's say, 90% of the tumor pixels, okay? So that's the basic problem set up here. And so we've reduced this from this complicated machine learning problem where we have to fit a model and so on and so forth into, well, we have a pre-trained model that gives us these probabilities that might be wrong. Now let's calibrate our level lambda so that um, we're sort of at a safe level. Okay? So... Just writing down a little bit of math to get started, you know, warming up into it. Um, the false negative rate, which is the fraction of the true tumor pixels that you contain, um, or that you don't contain, the fraction of the tumor pixels that you don't contain is a false negative rate. This is, this is a risk. Um, it's the expected value of a loss function. 
Um, this loss function is, has a name. It's called the false negative proportion. Uh, and I've written it here. It's just saying the fraction of tumor pixels that you don't contain. It's one minus the fraction of the tumor pixels that you do contain. Okay, And that, that'll be our risk in this problem. We index it with lambda. What do we mean by that? What I mean by that is, you know, as lambda grows and shrinks, I'm including more or fewer tumor pixels in my set, right? So obviously this is going to be, a, you know, the, not, the fraction of the pixels in the tumor that you contain is going to be a function of how many pixels are contained in your prediction set. So the more pixels I include, uh, the lower my risk is going to be. And eventually it's going to be zero uh, if I include the entire image. Okay. So what, what do we seek here? Well, we have this risk function that we talked to you about. Um, and by the way, the techniques that I'll talk about work for um, a general risk. They don't work for just this risk. Uh, but you know, you should keep the false negative rate in mind. Um, R of lambda is a risk. So I plotted it here. In this case, it's a U-shaped risk. It's, you know, it's bad to be on either side and you want to be somewhere in the middle. Um, and the, basically, the goal, in some sense, is that we have this pre-specified risk parameter alpha. We don't, we don't want our risk to exceed alpha. Uh, and we'd like to pick all values of the threshold that, uh, that are consistent with that. Okay, So places where the risk is below alpha is what we want to find. Now, of course, we're not going to be able to get this whole set um, because there's some statistical error involved. Right? We have finite samples. Uh, we can't estimate the risk function perfectly. Uh, and the game that we're going to play is trying to account for those statistical fluctuations. So we're going to get a subset of this um, that all of which is guaranteed to be sufficiently sort of high quality, you know, to satisfy our error rate guarantee. So on that note, I'm going to ask you a question uh, as the viewer. Um, and the question is the following. Okay, so let's define our empirical risk to be... Um, the normal thing that it usually is, which is the average of the loss function. You can think about this as the false negative proportion. In this case, this would be the estimator of your false negative rate. Okay, So you've estimated your false negative rate from n samples in your calibration data set. Okay? So what if I plotted r hat lambda as a function of lambda? Okay, So that means I took the empirical risk at each value of lambda and then I just plotted it as a curve. And then I thresholded it at level alpha, and then I called that my set. So I return this to you, and I say, well, this is, these are the spots where my risk is controlled. Is that OK? So the question is, is that OK? So think about it for a moment. I have a guess, Anastasia. <laughs> OK, <laughs> go ahead. I don't think it's going to work. And why is that? Um, well, earlier you were going on and on about statistical fluctuations. I feel true. like there's something going on there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So basically what's happening is that you've, you've estimated your risk from finitely many samples, right? So you have all these wiggles. That's why I've drawn the curve so crazy. Um, and those wiggles, uh, you haven't accounted for them yet. So you might be overly optimistic. You might be taking things in your set that you shouldn't be um, because of just random fluctuations in your data. Okay? So... The game that we're going to play again is we're going to control for those. And the real procedure that we use to control for those is called learn then test. Okay, So in learn then test, there's, there's basically uh, two sub steps. Um, so we take our space lambda, which we've discretized uh, into n discrete points, um, big N here. And then we index each of these lambdas with a null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that the risk at lambda lambda sub j, you know, the j at lambda, is not controlled, okay? So that's that null hypothesis. And then we get p-values for each of those null hypotheses with concentration inequalities, okay? So just thinking about this for a moment, when the p-value is small, it means you reject the null, right? And what does that mean in this case? The null is the risk is not controlled. So by rejecting the null, we're saying the risk is controlled. So it's a little bit of like a double negative situation, but you know, once you get it straight, the p-value is small, means the risk is controlled at that lambda because the null hypothesis is rejected. Okay, so we have p-values for each of these null hypotheses, but now we have a big bag of null hypotheses. Um, and so we need to correct for the fact that we've taken multiple p-values with multiple testing procedures. Here I've drawn Bonferroni, um, but you can actually use any uh, family-wise error rate controlling procedure to do this. 
Uh, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. So what that looks like in terms of the picture that I drew before is you have your curve with statistical fluctuations here. And we've indexed our lambdas in a discrete way. And we're just going to reject as many of them as we can um, based on the p-values in the multiple testing procedure that we select. Okay, so now let's get into each subset um, separately. So first we, we have to generate p-values. So as we said earlier, for the null hypothesis, let's just write it here, h, I guess, of lambda j, that is the null hypothesis that the risk is not controlled at lambda j, or in other words, the risk is greater than alpha there. Um, and the p-value is like the strength of evidence against that null hypothesis, okay? So p-values look like this, roughly. Um, they're, they're super uniform random variables. Um, you can think about them as sort of putting this, the evidence on, on a uniform scale so that when you threshold the p-value at level delta, um, there's only sort of delta fraction of the time under the null that's going to happen. Okay, so small p-value means there's a lot of evidence against your null hypothesis because that really wouldn't happen much under the null hypothesis. Um, so that's why we're thresholding small p-values. I've, I've shown an example of a p-value here, a small p-value, or a, a way of constructing p-values. This is the p-value that you would get from Huffington's inequality. Um, and Huffington's inequality is, uh, is valid for bounded losses just like Huffington's inequality. So whenever you have a loss that's, say, bounded between 0 and 1, you can use this p-value um, to generate uh, a p-value for the null hypothesis that the risk is not controlled at lambda. Um, and in fact, we, we do this and we actually also use more sort of involved um, p-values in our papers that are tighter when, you know, under different con conditions on the loss. So you can, of course, go farther than Huffington's inequality. We're not going to talk about that now, but you should, if you're interested in implementing this in practice, there's really tight ways of, of getting good p-values. So now we have p-values for every null. And I'm going to ask you another question. I know it's been a big day with the questions, but we're going to ask another one. Um, the question is, why can't I just include all the p-values that are less than or equal to delta in my set? All right, so we know the probability under the null that the p-value is less than delta is less than or equal to delta. That's the definition of a super uniform. Um, but why can't I just do this? So here I've just you know, indexed my discrete set of lambdas the bars, the height of the bars, the height of, is the value of the p-value. I've drawn delta here. And why don't I just take this to be my prediction set? Do you have another guess? I have a guess on stats, yes. Um, well, I sliced up my grid into a lot of different points, or I have many different chances. Even though I only have a small chance at making an error at any one of those points, if there's a lot of points, I might have a lot of total errors, right? Yeah, that's right. So the probability that you make an error rises with the number of hypotheses. Um, so if you, if you want all of these, all of the discoveries that you make here, all of the lambdas that you select to be good ones, you're going to need to apply a more stringent constraint. Okay. Of course, so Stephen I, knows this well. So I got it right? Yeah, you got it right. <laughs> Believe right. it or not, Stephen got it right. All right. Um, yeah, so the answer is you can't do this. Um, and it's because if you threshold at the delta level, you're roughly making uh, big N, where N is the size of your grid, big N times delta false discoveries. Okay, so you're making that many false selections of lambda. So instead, we're going to use a different threshold, delta over N, that makes this equal to delta. All right. Uh, and that's called the Bonferroni correction. So that's what this is what it looks like graphically. It's a more stringent uh, way of testing the several hypotheses together. And you get a joint guarantee that all the lambdas that you get out of this procedure are going to be good ones. So that's called family-wise error rate control. Now, we're not going to go into this here, but you can use any family-wise error rate controlling procedure to do this. It doesn't need to be Bonferroni. And in fact, there's much tighter versions that we have uh, in you know, the written works. Uh, I think we also talk about this in the written version of the gentle intro a little bit, uh, where under certain conditions on the loss, for example, monotonicity, uh, you don't need to do this delta over n thing. You can just uh, do it at level delta. Um, and you can't always do that, but you, you can always do something slightly better than Bonferroni. Um, and uh, we discussed that. We discussed that. 
So just to recap, what we did is we discretized lambda into this discrete space. Um, and then we constructed p-values for the null that the risk is not controlled. Small p-value means the risk is controlled. And then we use multiple testing to combine them into a region here. Now you can pick any lambda in that region. You could, oftentimes we're interested in like the, the largest or the smallest lambda that controls yeah. the risk. Um, so for example, in the tumor case, you would want to pick uh, the smallest set. That's one of the extreme points. Um, but sometimes you also want the whole thing, you know, maybe you want to optimize within there or something. Uh, so you can do that too. Now we're going to hit some examples. All right. Thanks, Anastasios. So next I'm going to talk about an example of OOD detection together with confidence sets on the predictions. And I really can't stress the importance of this example enough. I think whenever you're deploying a classification model or any supervised learning model, you want to have this OOD layer in there to flag when you see anomalous inputs. So I think this is something that should be standard practice when you implement um, a classification or a supervised learning model in general. Okay, so in the learn then test framework, this is completely automatic. We can do it um, just right out of the box. So let's consider this case where we're doing classification. I have this picture of a squirrel um, and the squirrel has this cool hat on it. Okay, as before, right? All right, the, the cool hat means that this thing is probably OOD. So when I see this thing, I want my algorithm to say, this is a, a pretty strange squirrel. Anastasios must have concocted this squirrel, okay? All right, so now when I do that, again, I have kind of two choices. I can say, yes, it's OOD, or no, it's not OOD. Um, if it's not OOD, I wanna return a confidence set for the possible labels of this image, okay? So I start off with an image. It has, uh, the ground truth has an associated Y value, and I have a classifier, okay? Um, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna control two risks, one's for kind of each part, um, one for each option in this pipeline, the OOD part and the confidence segment part. So my first risk here that I'm gonna control is the probability that I return an empty set. Returning an empty set is kind of how we're encoding the outlier option. So this means outlier, okay? The second risk, and I should say, we don't want to flag in distribution things as outliers. So this is a risk where I want the probability of flagging an in distribution point as an outlier to be sufficiently low, say less than 1% of the time. Okay, next I have the statistical error rate corresponding to the confidence set part. This is how often do my points not fall into my prediction set. So how often did my confidence set not cover the true label? And I want that to be low, say less than 10% of the time. Okay. So my kind of pipeline end-to-end -end looks like this. I have some classifier, um, some set valued function t lambda. It's going to return the empty set if the top class is sufficiently unlikely. So this is my OOD layer, for example. If none of the classes appear sufficiently high probability to my classifier, I'm going to say that this input is out of distribution. Okay, that's the empty set. If that's not the case, if it looks good, then I'm going to return a confidence set where I include all classes that have probability above some level lambda 2. So I have two parameters here. I have lambda 1 controlling my OOD detection threshold, and I have lambda 2 um, indexing the size of my confidence sets. And I'm going to set both lambda 1 and lambda 2 in such a way to control these two error rates. Okay? And we do that using exactly the learn then test procedure that Anastasios just described. So next, we're going to look at a even more structured learning example. We're going to think about hierarchical classification. So in this setup, we input an image, and the output is a label, but the labels are uh, structured in such a way that every label corresponds to the leaf node of a tree. So for example, in this image right here, we have a picture of what is consume. Okay, consume is a leaf node in the tree, and then an interior node that corresponds to that is soup. Soup is a kind of subclass of dish. Dish is a subclass of nutriment and so on. So I have this tree over the label space that's telling me kind of how close or how far away two possible labels are. Okay. So we are, as before, you know, there's a ground truth label. In this case, it's ImageNet. So there's one of a thousand classes. And we start off with this classifier, which here is called pi hat. So for every image, I have a thousand dimensional vector telling me the probability, the estimated probability, which could be wrong, of, be, of having of the image corresponding to that class. Okay. 
Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say that um, when I make mistakes that are far away on the tree semantically, that's a more severe mistake than when I'm close on the tree semantically. So if I guess Labrador Retriever, and the correct answer is Golden Retriever, that's not a severe mistake. If I guess Labrador Retriever and the correct answer was like Fighter Jet, that would be an extreme mistake. Okay, so we can kind of talk about how close or far we are based on the uh, geometry of this tree. Okay, now, and the second thing that this allows us to do is when we're not sure about what an object is, we can kind of return uncertainty sets that are semantically meaningful. So when I don't know what type of dog it is, I can instead of saying golden retriever and then kind of failing confidently, I can just say dog. I know what type, I know it's a dog, I'm confident it's a dog, but I can't tell you what type of dog it is. So that's a prediction set, but a prediction set in this case also corresponds to an interior node of the semantic tree in the label space. So I can kind of choose to make predictions at a coarser or finer level of resolution according to the certainty I have about any input. And that, that problem, the higher, the um, sort of coarser or finer prediction um, problem is isomorphic to the prediction sets problem by what I told you before. So we can think about this as making coarser or finer predictions depending on our layer of uncertainty. Okay, so how do we carry this out in practice? Well, we have this loss function here. That's the key ingredient to the learn then test procedure. Our loss is, as I described before, it's gonna be the distance in tree space. So it's how many hops away do I need to go um, from my prediction set to the correct label? So let's say our prediction set was the interior node spaniel, which is a subclass of dog. Okay, and let's say the true answer, the true class was some subnode of cat. So it was a house cat, let's say. In that case, the error is about two, it's two hops away in the tree. I had to go two hops up the tree and then down to get to the cat label. So we're going to call that a loss of level two. If I had to go farther away, if I had to go all the way to um, candle or something like that, I would have to go up to dog, I'd have to go up to animal, and I'd have to go further up the tree before I could go down to candle. So that would be a more severe mistake. Okay. Now, with the geometry of the tree in mind, so that's the loss function encodes how costly a mistake is, how badly I made a mistake, and so I'm going to control that at some pre-specified level. I can say I want to be on average only two hops away from the right answer, or one hop away from the right answer. Okay. And then secondly, I'm going to use the topology of the tree to give these semantically meaningful sets. So I'm going to construct sets using this tree in a smart way. I'm going to start off at the most likely class. Let's say it's golden retriever, retriever or whatever. Okay. And then I'm going to kind of continually grow my prediction set, but only around the subtree. So my prediction set here is only going to be other dogs and the dogs closest to golden retriever until the sets are big enough to contain some amount of probability mass. Okay. And by constructing the sets in this way, again, what we're doing is we're making prediction sets that correspond perfectly to some interior node of this semantic tree. All right, we carry out an example of this procedure here on ImageNet. Um, we use a large number of calibration points with a ResNet as the true classifier. What you can see, and in this case, we were looking for a risk level of 10%. So we normalize the tree distance to make this 10%. Um, we're controlling the risk in the simulated experiment, of course as the theory tells us we must. And what we find in the ImageNet example is that we make discoveries that are kind of more or less spread out evenly among the levels of resolution. So we make a bunch of predictions that are point predictions. We're confident it's a golden retriever and so on. And then the rest of this here is showing that we're making resolutions evenly up and down the layers of the tree. So there are many examples where I can only make a prediction at the third level of resolution there are some where I can make it at the second level of resolution, and so on and so forth. So this prediction set machinery together with learn then test allows us to do control complicated error rates such as those in this um, multi-resolution classification example. Great. So Stephen just gave you two compelling examples of how to control risk for pretty interesting and complicated machine learning problems. Um, now we're going to hit probably the most complicated. Um, which is instance segmentation. Whoa. So an instance, seg instance segmentation is a, a, a kind of a, a crazy prediction problem when you try to write it out mathematically. What's happening is that, you know, you take an image in, so the image is your X, um, and we're not gonna do this too formally, it's just sort of gonna be intuitive because otherwise it would be a soup of notation. 
But what's happening is you take this input image and then there's a bunch of objects in it, okay? So there's this person, there's the skateboard, there's this other person, there's the bike, there's this ramp. I think that's, is that a, a, is that a person or a dog back there? <laughs> there's a bunch of stuff in this image. And your goal is, you know, you have three goals basically. Your first goal is to identify, you know, as many objects in the image as you can. And then the second goal is now you have this classification model of hat. F hat now classifies them, okay? So now you have O hat of X, where O hat is the number of objects that are estimated by your algorithm to be in the image. You have that many vectors of softmax scores, okay, in this big matrix. And then also for each object, you get a mask, okay? Or the, rather the, the model gives you like the same segmentation out, output as we had before. It gives you like the probability um, that this thing comes from an object. Um, and those are the, the mask activations that I've shown here. Um, and of course, now we're gonna do two things with those outputs. The first thing is, is we're gonna give prediction sets on each object. So we're gonna try to give you coverage um, in, a, in a certain average sense over the image. Um, and the second thing we're gonna do is um, give you uh, an object mask. So do a segmentation that has IOU control that guarantees that sort of the overlap of your mask with the underlying object is good. And IOU, by the way, is a non-monotone risk. Um, it's like a U-shaped risk that we had before. Um, and then the third thing is that, you know, on top of those two, we're going to try to guarantee that you contain most of the true objects in the underlying image. Okay, so that's called recall. Um, so we're going to control recall and coverage and IOU simultaneously uh, with the framework that we've been talking about before. Okay. So... Just to be clear, you can write these things as risks. So here's, by the way, another example, just another example of the detection framework. Um, there's these three risks. The first is the fraction of the ground truth objects missed. So this is one minus the recall, okay? Um, the second risk is one minus mean IOU within an image. So I look at all the objects within my image, I calculate the IOU at, when I threshold at lambda um, of, the, of the mask that I get out. Um, uh, that average is going to be, uh, I, one minus that average should be low, right? So I want that average to be high, high IOU. And then the last is this sort of average miscoverage within an image, which we're already somewhat familiar with, okay? So these are the three risks that we're going to control. And we're going to control them in, uh, by having a lambda that's three-dimensional. So now we're no longer looking on a, on a lambda that's on a, on a real line like this. Our risk is now like a volume. Um, our risk is along three dimensions of lambda. And in particular, the first risk is uh, mostly controlled by lambda one, which is the, the threshold at which we allow objects to be considered as detections. So, you know, if an object is sufficiently probable, we're gonna consider it as part of our image. Um, and then the second one is gonna be controlled by lambda two. You know, lambda two is our segmentation threshold. So let's just write these down. Lambda one, you know, is like argmax softmax mm -hmm. score, and it controls risk one. Lambda two is the segmentation threshold, you know, just like we had before. That's lambda two. Um, and then lambda three is gonna be, you know, whatever form of conformal classification threshold that you want. So, you know, this might be, um, you know, the, if you have softmax scores that look like this, it might be this level, for example. Or it could be the APS score that we talked about earlier. In fact, in the paper, we use APS. Um, so by tuning these three things properly, using the same procedure as before, um, you know, constructing a null hypothesis for each risk and then controlling them all at the right level, um, we can uh, ensure that the probability that any of these three risks is violated uh, is small. It's smaller than delta. Um, so if you guys want to read that in more detail, along with a bunch of other examples, you should uh, go through the gentle intro. Um, the, the actual written version that we have on, on archive and, you know, on our websites and so on. Um, that will lead you through some of the nitty gritty math of how you do this for multiple risks, which we haven't fully explained here. Um, but it's, it's pretty simple. Um, and I hope that this video has uh, shown you that that's the case. So just in summary here, um, we know how to do distribution free control of risks, right? So that's the big win. Yeah. There's a ton more examples besides the three we've showed you here. You can really handle any machine learning problem where you have uh, this kind of well-defined notion of statistical errors. 
Yeah, and you can control them by bounding basically their natural error rate. So, you know, where coverage doesn't make sense, like in detection, what does it even mean to have coverage, right? It's almost nonsensical to think about. But now that you can control these other statistical error rates, you have a, you know, right. much stronger sense that, that you can give as a practitioner of what's the performance of my algorithm and how do I guarantee that it's good. We had IOU, we had recall, we had OOD, the false discovery rate. We have all these things, coverage, the false negative rate. You know, there's many different kind of natural notions here for, for different problem setups. Exactly. Yeah, and you can use the same framework to address them all. So that's it for today's video. Um, who knows when we'll be back? Who knows? You know, we'll drop in in another few months, you know, or something. <laughs> Hopefully sooner. <laughs>